508, how are you? So this is the week of the 24th, and so we'll have two different um, lesson plans, okay, two different sections that we are going to be going over. I'll go over the first right now, and my second video will be the second um, part that we'll go over, okay? Um, again, remember how we approach this class, okay? And you can download the syllabus to, to keep track with uh, the pacing, and then then uh, the calendar that is indicated in the syllabus is also shown when you go into these two working areas that you're responsible for doing, okay? Um, I will also end by going in here and discussing a little bit about your upcoming reading assignment that's due on July 1st, so you got a little ways to go, and that's where you make uh, a mock journal paper where you pretend like you're a scientist doing a study, all right? Okay, so we... Um, Start right here, okay, every, every single week. You click on that, okay, and I think you guys know the drill because I've seen a lot of you guys are in there um, doing the quizzes, okay, which shows me you know what's going on. And then also you're doing the associated discussion board, which we'll go into a, into, into a second, okay. So I sent out an email um, last night, okay, where I just tried, tried to break down with both um, a little bit of reading, um, kind of everyday uh, verbiage of uh, how to understand um, the physiological act action of the stress response. When I say the physiological action, how we go from our perception up here in our brains and how we then go down through the hierarchy of the brains. It all starts with this, the, when your sensory information comes in, we have this center that weighs the, the, the kind of the risk and the threat of the threat of the inf coming information. Like you hear a rattlesnake, okay, and boom, you immediately alert it, alert it, okay. So that sensor information then goes to this amygdala and says, "Did you hear this?" And the amygdala immediately goes back to our memory center, the hippocampus, and says, "What was that?" And once everybody's in agreement, boom, it sets into action this major stress response by going from the amygdala to the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus then connects with um, uh, the gland down here, the pituitary gland, that's the slow response, but it also has direct wiring. The hypothalamus goes zzz, right down our spinal cord, out to all the body parts, like my eyes, so they get wide open. Suddenly I can hear everything. My heart starts racing. It, it goes to my adrenal gland and dumps adrenaline. So that's what this is all about, okay? And then it tries to connect to, to some of these greater issues, okay? Alrighty, so we are um, really getting into this concept of connecting the mind and brain processes to the rest of your body's physiology. So it is this mind-to-body connection. Okay, all right. So one classic issue that uh, people in modern society have to deal with, okay, and sometimes this is um, appropriate, okay, because um, you've had a significant challenge in your life, okay, and what I'm talking about is clinical depression. Um, there are categorizations of, out there of quote-unquote appropriate and inappropriate. Inappropriate meaning you're just genetically predisposed to have very small events to trigger um, a truly organic biological clinical depressive ex uh, event, and as Dr. Dr. Sapolsky reviews in his lecture, this is a great lecture, okay, it's an hour long, but I encourage you to watch it, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just as biological as somebody um, that has the juvenile form of diabetes, is what he, the, the act that he, he, the idea he brings up, okay, where people have lots of compassion for that. It's just as, as biological as somebody having a stroke, okay? It's just as biological as somebody getting cancer, okay? It is not something that has to do with your willpower, okay? Um, you can also have this, this, this other kind of depression where you have um, life-altering experiences, okay? So, um, so we, you know, we just got back. Uh, so this is Sunday night. I'm putting this together. And uh, my co-instructor, Julia, is upstairs sleeping, um, because once a month she goes down to UCSD Moore's Cancer Center and gets an infusion of antibodies to help her out to fight off infection because she has leukemia. And this is, um, this is all part she's in, um, finishing up her third year of a clinical trial where her body is a test tube tr treating novel drugs 
um, that will hopefully move the field of leukemia. Um, uh, the, the kind of leukemia she has is more adult onset, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Hopefully it'll move it forward, okay? Um, so when she first got diagnosed with cancer, you know, we went into a tailspin. Her as her life flashing before her because, because nobody ever wants to get that, you know, that, that C cancer diagnosis. And she uh, was depressed. She was not herself, you know, and goes through a lot of the symptoms that uh, Dr. Dupolsky talks about, you know, where you lose interest in the very things that, that used to give you the most pleasure in life, okay? This psychomotor agitation, okay? And then me, as her spouse, as her best friend, as her supporter and caregiver, I also found that I felt like I was depressed, okay? And I just wasn't enjoying things as much, okay? So these are very real things, and there are drugs out there um, that can help you to um, um, alter your brain chemistry improve your brain chemistry so that it is no longer in a pathological state. And the reason you're depressed is your brain chemistry is in a pathological state, meaning it's not behaving the way it used to or the way that everybody else is, okay? So, um, you know, and it's just like having a severe bacterial infection in your sinuses, okay, or in your GI tract. You take an antibiotic and you get rid of that. It's no different. You know, with clinical depression, you have the option for taking drugs called antidepressants that that may help you. Everybody's different. Uh, the kind of the, the dosing and and the kind. Everybody's genetically different. Okay, so um, so these are all options. Okay, so Julie uh, went on Trintalix and said, "All right, and it works. It works. Okay, for us. All right. Okay. Um, so that being said, so this is a, a you know a, a link between the stress response and the perception of stress, okay? And that's the problem that people have with clinical depression. They, they cannot let go. They, it's a, it's a uh, psychological concept called rumination, okay? Where you sit there and you just go over and over and over again. You cannot cope. You cannot release. And you uh, find yourself, you can feel it physiologically in your body, you feel ill, and it's because of the activation of your stress response, okay? Um, long term, um, we can go here. This is a, a PDF file. I'll go directly to the website. So you, these are both the same, so you can choose, okay? And long term, so this is the website. There are some, some significant physiological consequences, okay? So... This right here is a, it's an amazing um, uh, online textbook called Diabetia. Okay, it's like Wikipedia, but it's devoted to diabetes. Okay, so it talks about in here the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Okay, so when I'm stressed out, my amygdala activates the hypothalamus. Okay, it has the direct wiring that releases adrenaline, the fast component, and then number two is you go to the pituitary. You release that hormone, all right? So, so you have a corticotropin releasing factor. The pituitary releases adrenocorticotropin hormone, or ACTH. It goes down to my adrenal gland, and it releases cortisol, okay? And cortisol does all kinds of things. It in increases fuel, both in the form of glucose, but you'll see in this article, also in the form of fat, okay? Uh, but if you're just sitting there, spinning your wheels, you're not being chased by a lion, which is one form of stress where you need all that fuel, but if you're just psychologically ruminating, then what happens is the stress doesn't end, the, um, the glucose that gets released and the fat that gets released from all stores around your body then gets repackaged in your gut, and this creates a major inflammatory um, kind of cauldron in your gut. All righty. So these are all these different measures, and that's what this is all about, of testing the stress response. Um, what I would like you to do is kind of sit through here and think about it. You know, the classic one is salivary cortisol, okay, because when you wake up in the morning, it has a daily pattern. I need some fuel, so boom, I have a burst of, of cortisol that's released um, into the blood, and it gives me some fuel so I can get my engine going, get me going, okay? You can use these measures okay, as um, your experimental design, your methods in your um, 
uh, paper, your six-page paper that you're going to create. So you're going to do a manipulation. You're going to measure stress, and these are the kind of methods that you might use. Okay, and you'll have some some um, yeah, independent variable. Okay, which is, which is your manipulation. I'm going to show you um, a former student use exercise. You can use meditation. Okay, you can use sitting in the sun. Whatever it is. Okay, that. Um, you think might improve the outcome, and this would be some. So you would have a behavioral measure, and you can also have this physiological measure, set of measurements. Okay, and that's what this is all about. Now, as they go through here, again, the the, the issue with people that are depressed is they have a low grade chronic activation. So their resting level activation of this HPA axis is going to be higher. So they're going to have a resting level. Um, elevation of cortisol that that again this is you know 24 hours a day so this chronic activation begins to have all kinds of serious um, health consequences like I said you're going to redistribute your fuels and you're going to generate um, the medium to have um, abdominal obesity okay abdominal fat okay that's just one problem um, the elevated cortisol causes major problems in terms of insulin resistance that contributes to diabetes along with the inflammation from your tummy, okay? Since you're releasing free fatty acids, those, those contribute to insulin resistance, okay? So these, this is this chronic low grade, okay? Now, because we have this feedback interaction between our blood levels of cortisol and how our brain is going to respond to a real uh, stressor or real physiological um, uh, events, then you see kind of a disruption. And if so, so there in here in this in this um, article, they talk about it's kind of a disruption of the behavior of this axis. So sometimes you might see, uh, for example, when people wake up, you think, well, they have they have chronic elevated cortisol, so they're going to wake up and their cortisol is going to be higher. That's actually not the case, okay? Because the chronic cortisol of impacts the ability of your wake-up signal to give you a burst. So you don't get that burst and you feel lethargic, okay? All right. So they're talking about that right here in terms of when you say a diurnal pattern, that's the variability between your day. So you have this change, um, okay? So we're looking at um, um, going from awakening to bedtime, all right? And so it serves a very important purpose. All right, so then at the very end of the article, okay, we look at the dysfunction, dysfunction of this, and then this gets into the discussion that I was talking about. And um, what it gets into is, is how it alters your fat reserves, how it alters your, um, your release of uh, hormones called cytokines by your immune system that, that in combination with elevated fat, okay, cortisol, so these, these three things, your immune system hormones, your elevated fat, and the cortisol, all can create this situation of, of insulin resistance, okay? So that's what we're showing about, we're showing right through here, okay? So high cortisol, high cortisol, insulin resistance, higher fat, insulin resistance, and then right here, this elevation of these um, uh, your immune system hormones, insulin resistance, that then contributes to type 2 diabetes, okay? All righty. In depression, uh, because you have chronically elevated um, cortisol, it's uh, as the arrow shows over here, it's impacting this serious control center in terms of maintaining the proper link. So this is where the big impact is here. And we saw it also in the, the PowerPoint that I just sent you. Okay. All right. So this shows you the review. Okay. It's a pretty short paper. Um, but I get you to start thinking about stress and a, a truly, you know, human condition, clinical depression, okay? And, and so many different factors can contribute to clinical depression. People that have uh, PTSD have clinical depression oftentimes, okay? Um, we have, like I said, appropriate reasons. You have, a, you have a loss of a spouse. You have a loss of a relationship. You get a, you get a, a really poor diagnosis like Julia did. All these contribute to uh, the development of clinical depression. Okay, awesome. So we're done with that. Again, uh, Dr. Sapolsky here goes through a real nice lecture on depression. You then click right here, okay, 
and you do your quiz. Okay, and there it is. Now, the, these quiz questions don't count an enormous amount towards your final grade, so don't worry about it. Okay, I had one student kind of a, so say, send me an email saying, "God, I didn't do as well as I wanted to do." That's okay. This is a, this is all part of the learning process. Okay, I would just want you to learn from this. Okay, and what the quiz allows us to do is just to make sure you guys are staying on board and keeping up with the course. Okay. All right, that's awesome. So then we get in here, okay? Sorry, I'm going to leave that. And this again, this reminds you how to post on the discussion board. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over here and I'm going to get into the discussion board post. Okay, so um, this was last week's, okay, discussion board. Um, the reason I'm showing this right now is this concept of epigenetics, all right? So if you have chronically elevated stress hormones and and you find the um, the uh, hypothalamic pituitary, pituitary axis is not working right, that is going to change the way you read the genes in your DNA, okay? Flipping these switches, okay? We heard about methylation in when we were looking at the last one, okay? And that's going to cause problems. It's going to cause um, problems in terms of the genes that are turned on that maybe predispose you to even further clinical depression, that maybe further predispose you to diabetes, and, um, and really blunt and mess up your response to cortisol. Okay, so I'm going to get out of my preview right now. So, so this is all student view. I'm going to continue on. And I'm going to take a look at my view, and the only reason I'm doing this is I want you to get to look at the upcoming discussion. Okay, so this discussion is going to get released tomorrow, okay, and um, I'm on Tuesday morning, I'm sorry, but early in the morning, like one minute after midnight, okay, and uh, we see right here discussions all about clinical depression, okay, and so um, this is what we hope you learn a little bit from it, a little background, okay, um, we talk about these diurnal rhythms of cortisol, okay, and we you what do we use this for? I'm telling you right now, we need to increase the uh, the the uh, fuel in our blood um, and arousal when we wake up. Okay, and is it normal when people are depressed? Okay, so you ask that, ask yourself that. Okay, Dr. Sapolsky talks about it, and the the, the the reading talks about it. Okay, I just talked about the epigenetics. Okay, that was from our last lecture. Okay, uh, what are the epigenetic changes? Okay, so we have these switches from the last lecture. You know, one of them was methylation, and another one was called acetylation or acetylation. You choose, okay? Tomato or tomato, okay? And they both are going to either wind up the DNA so you can't get that recipe to make the new protein, or they're going to expand the DNA so you can go in there and open up your book, read the recipe, and make whatever protein you need, okay? Sometimes you're making too much of one kind of protein, okay? That's a bad situation, or you're making too little. And remember, we have thousands and thousands of proteins okay all right so you might discuss how this might happen with depression okay and changes okay again dr sapolsky talks about this as well all right the disruption this to explain to us what's going on in terms of this, this disruption this axis all right all right so and uh, i have that in my review and i've sp already spoke about it again remember the feedback control okay it's not proper okay and, um, and how elevated chronic cortisol leads to diabetes, okay? Do the best you can. I love you guys. I know you're not biologists. You know what? If you just think about it and then you articulate it through your fingers moving on the keyboard, it enhances your learning. And, and you're going to become familiar with this. So now you'll be able to talk about this with your physician. You'll be able to talk about this with caregivers. You'll be able to talk about this with different members of your corporate structure as you're developing a plan to reduce stress. Okay, all righty. Dr. Sapolsky and I have also talked about other hormones, okay, that change in depression, okay. Um, um, the primary target of the standard of care clinical depression is serotonin, okay. And uh, serotonin is all about feeling like you belong, feeling like you have control. It's affecting this part of your brain, the front part of your brain. Remember, this front part of your brain is uh, a target of elevated chronic cortisol, and it atrophies 
and the circuitry gets disrupted. And it contributes to that purely frontal cortex driven thing of clinical depression. So we can now alter the activity by taking antidepressants, okay, that change the levels of serotonin, okay, because we need to elevate serotonin and the responsiveness to serotonin. These brain areas then network together and they also affect our arousal levels, okay, that's the adrenaline or the kind of adrenaline that's released in the brain called noradrenaline, all right? Super important, okay? The last thing is our pleasure. Do Oh, have we lost the ability to, to have pleasure with even the most simplest of activities? How about those things that, that we've, you know, our whole life has been rotating around? Uh, for me, it is surfing, okay? It gives me the greatest pleasure. Hanging out with Julie, it gives me the greatest pleasure, all right? Um, so there is a disruption in the release of dopamine into our pleasure centers when all these problems happen. Okay, so that's what is discussed right there. Okay, all right, so lastly, as promised, um, I do want to go back over here, and we see July 1st is the, I'll click on that, and that takes us to the journal paper assignment. And again, this, this um, goes through the kind of things that you do. Here, I'm not going to read the direction, just read through them, okay? Again, this is a make-believe assignment, so you're going to have your results section, and um, and you'll you'll create data, okay? And with that data, you'll plot it, okay? And you'll have figures, all right? Um, just like any other paper, you're going to have a, um, a face page, and it goes through your affiliation, an abstract, an, in, uh, an introduction where you give the background as to why you're doing this study, the methods that you use, just like I said, okay? Um, in terms of acquiring data, the outcomes, okay? And then you reflect back on some of the things that prompted the study, but how your results interact in, in, in further knowledge in that area. And that's what the discussion's all about, okay? You follow these directions right here, okay? It's, it's just a mock paper, it's six pages long. Um, what we did is we actually had an old student of ours um, send us and we created a, a PDF file. And I'm gonna click on that, all right? So you can see there it is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce it. All right, sorry. I'm going to say okay. This no. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm going to get it down to a more man. Oops, sorry, more manageable size. Okay, and how about that? Okay. So uh, this was Sarah Holtzman's, and so this was her paper: high intensity interval exercise paired with team building to develop resiliency against da daily stress. All right. If we go down a little bit. Reduction. So this is her face page, okay? Her affiliations, okay? Um, she then has the abstract, okay? Um, when we converted to a PDF file, it lost a little formatting, and that's okay. So that's what this is right here, so don't worry about that, okay? Um, so then this is her introduction with the citations, okay? Here are her methods, awesome. Well, how she did her study, boom, 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 boom. Here's the results section, okay? So she created a table, she created some figures, she also, um, in here, she described it, okay? And then she has a discussion, okay? And how her outcomes interacted with the literature. And there's our literature, boom, just like that, all right? So pretty straightforward stuff, guys. All righty, cool. Well, I want you guys to have a great week of the 24th, okay? Um, I'm not going to bombard you with my second video. I'll be producing that shortly, okay? Um, but um, I, I want to put your minds to ease. I know you guys aren't biologists, um, but it, this is awesome that you're going to be able to think in terms of biology, how the mind controls the physiology of your entire body, and how that impacts health consequences, things like um, diabetes, okay? Things like heart disease, okay? Um, and um, as we're going to go back over here to the readings, I just want you to see where we're headed now. And you can see this also in the, in the syllabus. So we're going to start talking about how elevated cortisol and stress can, can um, further depression, okay? Because it's, again, causing degradation of my front part of my brain and dementia, because this part of my brain with the hippocampus is all about learning and memory. Okay, um, and then we will uh, get into a real good discussion of diabetes, okay, heart disease, 
right? Um, and then from there on, um, we are um, going to be doing some intervention. Do you see here? One last little one in biology. You ever notice when you're stressed out that your immune system doesn't work right? So we'll be talking about psychoneuroimmunology. All right. And then you see the whole last part of the course is all about interventions. Okay. Um, try and be happy. Try and have gratitude. I have so much gratitude. I had a wonderful day today. Southern California was beautiful. Julie and I make the best of her two hours of infusion down at UC San Diego. We go down there and we and we, we, we watch videos together and we laugh. And that's what it's all about. Okay. Alrighty, guys. You take care and do not worry. You guys are killing it.